Father, I pray that it would be true this morning, Lord. Lord, that we would set our eyes on you, Lord, and that there would be no one else that we are focused on except you, Lord. That we would take our eyes off of ourselves, Lord, and set them on you. Lord, I pray that you would help us this morning. Open up our, our eyes, Lord, our ears, our minds to understand your word, Lord, and what you have prepared for us. Lord, I pray that you would speak through me during this time, Lord, that I would not say anything that is not of you, Lord, and that my words would be true. Father, I pray that you would be speaking to each and every person uh, this morning as we uh, dive into your word, Lord. I pray these things in your name. Amen. Good morning, everyone. Please be seated. How's everyone doing today? Uh, praise God. It is probably our, nas- or our la- last nice day of the year. It's supposed to be something like 78 or 76. But get out there and enjoy the nice weather before it turns cold. If you don't know me, my name is James. I'm the pastoral intern here. Uh, Pastor Mike and his family, they're away in Massachusetts for a wedding. So you can pray for them as they uh, drive back and uh, that they'll just be resting and having a great time while they're up there. But if I haven't met you yet, I'd love to uh, uh, talk to you afterwards out on the front porch. I get to know your name and your story. And uh, if you have any questions for me, I'd love to discuss them with you. Uh, This uh, morning, we're looking in John 14, and we'll be looking at verses 8 through 14 in your Bibles. If you don't have uh, your Bible or notes, you can raise your hand. We will get them to you. Uh, And I, I encourage you to have both with you. The notes have... Uh, all of the Bible verses that I'll be discussing, so it's an easy place to reference, but make sure you uh, get them if you don't have them. But again, John uh, chapter 14, verses 8 to 14, you can turn there if you haven't yet. So John is the fourth gospel uh, in the New Testament. And then, uh, so Pastor Mike, last week he preached through 14, 1 through 7, we're going to pick up right where he left off. So John chapter 14. Uh, verses 8 to 14. And if you're able, uh, I ask you to please stand with me this morning for the reading of God's Word. All right, verse 8. Philip said, Lord, show us the Father, and we will be satisfied. Jesus replied, Have I been with you all this time, Philip, and yet you still don't know who I am? Anyone who has seen me has seen the Father, so why are you asking me to show him to you? Don't you believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words I speak are not my own, but my Father who lives in me does his work through me. Just believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me. Or at least believe because of the work you have seen me do. I tell you the truth, anyone who believes in me will do the same works I have done and even greater works, because I am going to be with the Father. You can ask for anything in my name, and I will do it, so that the Son can bring glory to the Father. Yes, ask me for anything in my name, and I will do it. Please be seated. So Philip, in this passage, he's following up on something that Jesus said right before in verse 7. He says, from now on you do know him and have seen him. And Philip says, Lord, show us the Father, and we will be satisfied. And I think Philip's question is one that has been commonly said throughout very much all of history. Perhaps you've had a conversation with an atheist that went something like this. If you show me God, then I'll believe. If he reveals himself to me, then I'll, then I'll believe. Then I'll believe you. And these types of statements are uh, pretty much, or they're generally disingenuous, Right? If God really did reveal himself to them, they would find a way to excuse it off or to ignore it. I think like Ebenezer Scrooge, oh, it's just a bit of undigested cheese in the stomach, right? You know, it's just a, my imagination that's getting to me, right? Such people, they want to in, uh, control their encounter with God. They don't want to place their faith with him or in him. But that's not what Philip is likely meaning here. Philip has been hearing stories throughout all of the Old Testament of God coming and revealing himself to people. 
Last time I preached, I mentioned the story in Exodus 33, where Moses asks to see God's face, and God says, well, you can't see my face because it will kill you, but you can see my glory as I pass by. And uh, uh, we have several other places in the Old Testament where God reveals himself to different prophets. The first I'll mention this morning is Isaiah chapter 6, verses 1 to 4. It says this, It was in the year King Uzziah died that I saw the Lord. He was sitting on a lofty throne, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Attending him were mighty seraphim, which are angels, each having six wings. With two wings they covered their face, with two they covered their feet, and with two they flew. They were calling out to each other, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of heaven's armies. The whole earth is filled with his glory. Their voices shook the temple to its foundations, and the entire building was filled with smoke. In other places, the prophet Ezekiel, he says this in chapter 1, uh, 26. He says, Above this surface was something that looked like a throne made of blue lapis lazuli. And on his throne high above was a figure whose appearance resembled a man. From what appeared to be his waist up, he looked like gleaming amber, flickering like a fire. And from his waist down, he looked like a burning flame, shining with splendor. All around him was a glowing halo, like a rainbow shining in the clouds on a rainy day. This is what the glory of the Lord looked like to me. Now, it, Scripture tells us these people, uh, nobody's seen the face of God, so they didn't truly see God in all of his glory. Uh, they were allowed a vision, a glimpse of it. And I think this is the sort of experience that Philip wants to have. He wants to be like Moses and see God's glory as he passes by. Philip is saying, you know, show us the Father, Lord. Show us the Father. Give us that big spiritual experience, and that will satisfy us. Pastor Mike, when he preached last week, he shared, the disciples in this moment, they're very nervous and scared. Jesus has been telling them that he's going to leave them, that he's going to be crucified, that one of them is about to betray him. And they're feeling anxious. They're uncertain. They're fearful. And Philip here, he thinks that if he has this big spiritual experience, that it will be enough, that it will alleviate him of his troubled heart. Right? What Philip is looking for is something to change his heart in the moment. And how does Jesus respond to Philip's request? Verse 9, he says, Jesus replied, I have been with you all this time, Philip, and yet you still don't know who I am? Anyone who's seen me has seen the Father. So why are you asking me to show him to you? And Philip is focused on the experience. Show us the Father, and then we'll trust you. God, give me that mountaintop experience, that high, and that will make everything better. But Jesus tells him that he is the thing that he is seeking. My first point for you this morning is don't seek the spiritual experience. Seek Christ. Don't seek the spiritual experience. Seek Christ. Times are going to come into your life when you're going to feel anxious and uncertain about the circumstances in your life. You may think that we need some sort of positive emotional experience to outweigh the negative one that we're currently going through. And this is a road to all sorts of destructive sin. We fill our lives with things that we think will please us in the moment that will give us that positive experience to outweigh the negative one. And they end up killing us instead slowly. And sadly, we can do this with our own spiritual life, with our walk with Jesus. We turn Jesus into a vending machine of feelings. We can go to him and just get experiences out of him in order to reassure ourselves. See, Jesus, I'm feeling really down right now. And what I need you to do is make me feel good, and that'll fix things. All right? It's a form of selfishness, cleverly disguised as sincerity. But Jesus, he doesn't want you to just have a bigger spiritual experience. We may think like Philip, Lord, show yourself to me in those moments of uncertainty. Jesus doesn't want to set our sights on just an experience, but on him instead. Uh, he wants the disciples to remember all the work that he's been doing, who has been with them this entire time. Uh, Jesus, he wants to be the apple of your eye. Think about your pupil. At that, that very point that all the light enters, Set that sight. Jesus is in sight in everything that you see. He is at the center of it. The apostles here, they put their trust in Jesus rather than their experience. If he truly gives them what they're asking for, to have this amazing vision, 
Now, I'm sure it will be big and miraculous, but it's not going to change the condition of their heart. It's not going to satisfy them. Jeremiah 17, 9, it says this. It says, the human heart is the most deceitful of all things and desperately wicked. Who really knows how bad it is? Jesus knows what their hearts need, and it's not a great vision of the Father. Though we may feel anxious and uncertain about the world around us, we correct our hearts by setting our sights on Christ. And I can attest to this personally. So three years ago, I went on a mission trip to the Middle East uh, with my wife, Sarah, and several other crew staff members. And uh, I have never really enjoyed just walking up to people and, and trying to share the gospel with them. It has always made me very anxious and nervous. And the whole week leading up to this trip, I was just feeling so stressed. I was thinking, you know, I'm going to have to go and share with these people. And I just had feelings of inadequacy. And the night before the trip, the night before we flew out, I had this crazy dream. And in this dream, I was doing a stage production of The Greatest Showman. And uh, in it, I was singing the song Never Enough, which is strange because it's sung by a woman in the movie, but we look past that. <laughs> and uh, it's my favorite song from the movie, so it, it's one that I know and like singing. And in my dream, I just I kept missing all of these rehearsals for this big performance of the show that was coming up. And in the middle of all this stress and anxiety, a booming voice started speaking into the middle of my dream. He said, James, the big performance coming up is your mission trip. And he said, all this stress and anxiety that you feel by missing the rehearsals is your lack of experience. But he said, James, you know the song, and all I want you to do this week is sing the song that lives in your heart. And the next morning, I wake up and I tell my wife and sister at breakfast, and I've got you know, tears in my eyes explaining this to them. And... Uh, my sister it tells me that she had been praying for me all night that an angel would come and reassure me in my sleep. And the point of the dream is this. Uh, you would think that, you know, after having a big, amazing experience like that, you'd think, James, you must never be nervous again sharing your faith with others. And you would be so wrong. <laughs> now, see, I, I was reminded in that dream that Christ already lived in my heart, that I had the gospel, that what I was to uh, do was to go and proclaim it. And I was reminded that Jesus was with me, that he was living inside of me. But when I was anxious, I was setting my eyes on myself, on my circumstance, rather than remembering who was with me, who was my comfort. And every time since then that I set my, uh, my eyes on Christ rather than myself, or my, uh, my eyes on myself rather than Christ, I feel anxious. And that, you know, there was uh, many months after this, again, I was feeling anxious about something, and I, I was praying to God, let me have that experience again. And remind me, James, you don't need the experience. Right? I am with you already. I am with you. I will grant you peace. Set your eyes on me. Another issue is simply just asking for a vision like this, is that when your heart is troubled, and if you really did want to see God's glory, it will leave you more troubled afterwards, and it will, it will terrify you and leave you scared. When God and angels reveal themselves to people, you know what the first thing that is normally said is? Don't be afraid. Right? When I, so when Isaiah has his vision, in Isaiah 6, 5, how does he re, uh, react? He says, then I said, it's all over. I am doomed, for I am a sinful man. I have filthy lips, and I live among a people with filthy lips. Yet I have seen the king the Lord of heaven's armies. When Ezekiel has his vision, he says this, this is what the glory of the Lord looked like to me. When I saw it, I fell face down on the ground and I heard someone's voice speaking to me. When John has his vision of Jesus, Revelation 1.17, he says this, when I saw him, I fell at his feet as if I were dead. But he laid his right hand on me and said, don't be afraid, I am the first and the last. So Isaiah was afraid for his life. You know, he realizes how sinful he is standing before a holy God. And Ezekiel and John pass out on the ground because they are overwhelmed. And we're like, yeah, that's the sort of experience I want. Right? A vision of God's glory in this manner that Philip is asking for is going to be terrifying. And it's going to be awesome at the same time. It's not going to be something easy to digest like Philip is hoping we do have this promise in the scripture. 
It says in Revelation 22.4, uh, when God is bringing down the new heavens and the uh, new earth, where he dwells with his people forever, it says, and they will see his face, and his name will be written on their foreheads. So one day, Philip's request to see the Father, to see his face, it won't be a request. It'll be a present and eternal reality. It'll be something that we experience every day, and we have that day to look forward to. Right? The glory and presence of the Lord will be near to us, and we will never have to seek it out again. So our second issue with Philip's request is answered by Jesus' response in verses 10 and 11. What does he say here? He says, don't you believe that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me? The words I speak are not my own, but my Father who lives in me does his work through me. Just believe that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me, or at least believe because of the work you have seen me do. So why is Philip's request to see the Father unnecessary? Because Jesus has been revealing the Father all along. So our second point here is the Father is revealed through the works of Christ. The Father is revealed through the works of Christ. This will make more sense when we get into point three. So just before this, again, Jesus has said that whoever has seen him has seen the Father. Now he says that the Father is in him and that he is in the Father. That the works that he uh, does come from the Father. The word, or excuse me, the words that he say, says come from the Father. That the works that he does reveal the Father. So Jesus' entire ministry has been revealing God the Father to the disciples and to the world. How does he do this? Luke 4, uh, 18 to 19, Jesus uh, is saying this. He says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, for he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim the captives that uh, will be re re excuse me, released, that the blind will see, that the oppressed will be set free, and that the time of the Lord's favor has come. So Christ came bringing good news to the brokenhearted, to the poor, the captive, came healing the blind, the sick, the lame, the leper. He proclaimed freedom to, uh, to those in spiritual captivity, that the good news of the gospel would be with those who are filled with anxiety and restlessness, that have been bound by a law that they cannot uphold, but that they would instead find their peace in him. He's been revealing that he is one with the Father, and that before Abraham ever existed, that he had always existed. He's revealed that he is the light of the world, the good shepherd, the great I am. And his ultimate revealing of the Father will be accomplished by his death and resurrection, bringing forgiveness of sins and ushering in the new covenant. What Jesus is doing here is he is confirming his triune nature. He say God is triune, he is the trinity. He says, anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. He also says the Father is in him and he is in the Father. When we, Christian theology, when we talk about this, when we say God is triune, we say uh, God the Son, or excuse me, God the Father, God the Son, Jesus, and God the Spirit are all God. All three of them are God, but they're all separate in persons. So they're all one being and one person. So it, our, the simple way to remember this is God is three persons and one being, or you can even say God is three in one. That's the simplest way. And we can explain this and understand it, but it's difficult to comprehend God being a trinity. And there's nothing else in existence that is like this, that where God is triune. And it, we should expect God's nature to be complicated and hard for us to comprehend. You can think about that as humanity has been making advances in sciences and we understand uh, the nature of atoms and physics, and we're getting into quantum mechanics and quantum computing now, how complicated is it that an atom can be in one place and not a place at the same time, right? It's just mind-boggling to think of the difficulty of understanding these concepts of the foundation of nature. And how much more complicated should we expect the nature of God to be, the one who controls and builds all of nature? And you wonder, okay, great, but what on earth am I doing with that this morning? Why does this matter to me? This is important for us because the Trinity, God's very nature, is foundational to our faith. It is foundational, so it's foundational to our beliefs about him, our ideas about God, right? They come from, our ideas about God, they come from scripture. We're not making these up. 
but we should know them and seek uh, to understand it. And if not, we're leaving ourselves open and vulnerable to the lies of the devil. That there are many religions and heresies out there that sound quasi-Christianity, and almost all of them change something uh, dealing with God's nature, right? Mormons and Muslims, they believe something very foundationally different about the nature of who God is. Uh, are you prepared to answer questions from a Mormon or a Muslim about uh, the nature of God, about who he is? Right? We should study this so that we're not led astray, but also so that we can lead people out of the lies into truth. Right? We should study. We should prepare ourselves. There's an awesome book out there called Delighting in the Trinity that I recommend everybody read. It. I recommend you write that down, Delighting in the Trinity. It is an easy read. It's like 100 pages. It's full of pictures. Uh, and it's witty, and it's humorous, and it, it's one of my favorite books I've ever read, and it helped me so much to grasp uh, understanding God as Trinity. But again, that was delighting in the Trinity. But let's continue, verses 12 to 14. It says this, I tell you the truth, anyone who believes in me will do the same works I have done, and even greater works, because I am going to be with the Father so you can ask for anything in my name, and I will do it, so that the Son can bring glory to the Father. Yes, ask me, ask me for anything in my name, and I will do it. So these are perhaps two of the most astounding promises in the whole New Testament. The first one says, anyone who believes in me will do the same works I have done, and even greater works. And we're like, whoa. So I'll get to do miracles, yeah? We'll multiply bread, fish, my bank account, Right? But what does this actually mean for us? Right? Is Jesus making this promise just to the apostles, or is it for all believers? And it does say in Scripture, it says, anyone who believes in me will do the same works that I do. So from the Gospels and the book of Acts, we see the apostles doing miracles. They're healing people, they're raising people from the dead. Uh, but the importance of the apostles being able to do miracles is that it declared the truthfulness of their message that they weren't making things up, that the gospel was true. But none of the apostles, or none of the apostles ever did a miracle that was greater than Jesus. And I think Jesus is saying here by his, his statement that we're going to do flashier, uh, more miracles than me. We're going to do more astounding things. Uh, you know, none of them ever calmed the storm or multiplied bread or walked on water besides Peter. Uh, but they did minister and share the gospel uh, much further and longer than Jesus did, right? Jesus was only, his earthly ministry only lasted three years. But the, the apostles, they carried the gospel into Africa, into Europe, into Asia, and beyond. And what does this look like for us? We're not apostles, right? We're just people. And our third point here is that we reveal the Father by revealing Christ to others. We reveal the Father by revealing Christ to others. So the apostles, they did the same work as Jesus. And what is this work? It's to reveal the Father to others uh, by their works. And so we get to do the same thing as the church. What does this look like for us? So two different ways. So the first is in Matthew chapter 25. It's a longer passage. It's starting in verse 31 to 46. It says this. It says, But when the Son of Man comes in his glory, and all the angels with him, then he will sit upon his glorious throne. All the nations will be gathered in his presence, and he will separate the people as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will place the sheep at his right and the goats at his left. And the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the creation of the world. For I was hungry, and you fed me. I was thirsty, and you gave me a drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me into your home. I was naked, and you gave me clothing. I was sick, and you cared for me. I was in prison, and you visited me. And then these righteous ones will reply, Lord, when did we ever see you hungry and feed you? Excuse me. Or thirsty and give you something to drink. Or a stranger and show you hospitality. Or naked and give you clothing. When did we ever see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the king will say, I tell you the truth. When you did it to one of the least of these, my brothers and sisters, you were doing it to me. Then the king will turn to those on his left and say, Away with you, cursed ones, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his demons. For I was hungry and you didn't feed me. 
I was thirsty and you didn't give me a drink. I was a stranger and you didn't invite me into your home. I was naked and you didn't give me clothing. I was sick and in prison and you didn't visit me. And they reply, Lord, when did we ever see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and not help you? And he will answer, I tell you the truth, when you refuse to help the least of these, my brothers and sisters, you were refusing to help me. And they will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous will go into eternal life. So what are people doing in these passages? Right, They're caring for the sick, the stranger, the hungry, the thirsty, those who are poor and needy, right? those people, the least of these who need our help. And Jesus says that when we do these things, when we're when we help these people, that we are doing it to himself. When we do these things, we are revealing the Father to others. Right? This is part of us doing the same works that Jesus is doing. These are all works that the church does. Right? Impact Church does them on a small level, but the church globally has been the, uh, doing them since its inception, helping the least of these, the poor, the needy. Right? The church, this Saturday, we're doing our coat giveaway. Right? Come, come help us. Be a part of putting clothing on those who are cold, who are in need. Come help us reveal the Father to others. All right, so the second part of how we get to do the works of Jesus is sharing the gospel with others. Matthew 28, 18 to 20, it's a well-known passage, says this, Jesus came and told his disciples, I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Therefore, go and make disciples of all the nations baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I have given you. And be sure of this, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. So we go and we make our Father known by sharing the gospel with others, by sharing Christ with them. We teach people the words of Jesus, right? To teach him, to trust him, to obey him, to make disciples of them. It's not sufficient to say, preach the gospel at all times, and when necessary, you were, use words. Right? You are going to have to open your mouth to declare the good news to someone else. That is what the gospel is. It is good news to be verbally shared with other people, to be declared. No one who experiences something amazing and joyful and wonderful keeps it to themselves, hoping that someone else will notice it and ask them about it. They declare it. I have good news to share with you. Right? So shall it be with you. Go and declare it. Verbally say it with somebody else. Tell them about what God has done in your own life. Tell them about Christ, how Christ has met you, how he has transformed you, how he has walked with you. That is what it means to share the gospel. Right? So when we do these two things, when we help others and when we share the gospel, right, the Father is revealed through our words and our actions. So what about this part on prayer, this last part? You know, pray anything in my name and I'll do it. You know, what a promise. You know, if we end up misinterpreting this verse, we can create something like this, a big old prayer list, you know? Uh, all right, Jesus, I've got my list here for you. All right, so first, you know, I want to have 100 people give their lives to Christ every time I preach, and I want to have a church filled with thousands of people every week, and while I'm at it, I'll take a new Corvette, and, you know, half a million dollar a year job every year. And uh, all for your glory, of course. You know, not my own glory. Definitely for your glory. You're saying, James, you don't need to pray for these things. You could just be a televangelist, right? And then you could get all of them. <laughs> you know, and it, you know we, we say things like this, and then we pray, you know, all I, all I, I pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, bing, bang, bam, it's done. You know, I said in Jesus' name. Right? Jesus' name is not just a magical word that we throw onto the end of a prayer. Right? No prayer in the New Testament that we ever see actually ends in Jesus' name. Amen. Right? To pray in the name of Jesus means to pray in union with who he is. It keeps us in a right perspective on prayer. You know, our litmus test is, again, what it says at the end of verse 13. So that the Father can be glorified. Right? Jesus' statements uh, here about prayer, it's in the context of revealing the Father to others. Here's some questions you can uh, help you think this through. Are you asking for things in your prayers that sound like they're for God's glory, but they're really for your own glory? Are you asking for success in life or in ministry? 
to make God look better so that you can inadvertently look better? Or is it really a prayer of humility? And could you look Jesus in the face and ask him for what you're asking him for? All right, we need to keep these things in mind as we pray. Jesus is not our genie. It's not our slot machine. But as we close this week, my challenge for all of you is this. Who will you reveal the Father to this week? Who will you reveal the Father to this week? This is not a, a yes nor question. It is a who question. Who in your life can you reveal the Father to? Is there someone that you can help and aid in some way? You're going to reveal the Father to them that way. Is there someone in your life that you can share the gospel with them? That you can go and declare the good news to them? And say, this is what Jesus has done in my own life. Let me share this with you. Who will you reveal the Father to this week? I want you to think about this before you leave. A real person. Who will you reveal the Father to this week? We have this promise from Jesus as we close. We'll be looking at it next week in John 14, 23. It says, Jesus replied, all who love me will do what I say. My Father will love them, and we will come and make our home in, with each of them. Right? I talked about God being triune. Because he is triune, he can come and make his home in us. He can fill you with the Holy Spirit. And when he fills you with that spirit, when you set your sights on him, instead of yourself, instead of your anxiety, instead of your circumstance, he will give you a peace that surpasses all understanding. He will give you a peace that will conquer that anxiety in your life. Right? He will enable, enable you and equip you to go and to reveal the Father to others. Please pray with me this week or as we close. Father, we thank you for the promises that you have given us in Scripture, Lord. Lord, that we get to do the works that you did, Lord, revealing the Father to others. Lord, I pray that we would uh, remember, Lord, to have a right perspective, a perspective that sets our sights on you, Lord. Lord, that looks to you instead of ourselves, that we would find our trust, Lord, in you, Lord, our peace in you rather than ourselves. Lord, that despite feelings of in inadequacy, Lord, and anxiety, Lord, Lord, that we would walk in faith, and that we would be a people who reveal the Father in all that we say, Lord, and in all that we do. If you aren't walking with Jesus this morning, if you have never given your life to Christ, and you would like to, to have that peace, to have the Spirit come and live in your heart, that you would hear his voice, you can pray this. Lord, I realize that I have gone my own way and that I have done so much against you. Lord, I ask you to forgive me, Lord, for the ways that I have lived according to myself rather than you. God, I pray that you would come and enter into my life. Lord, I surrender myself to you. Lord, teach me to listen to your voice rather than my own. Lord, I pray that as we, as we go about our week, Lord, as we see the people in our lives, Lord, our neighbors, our coworkers, our family members, our friends, Lord, that we would reveal the Father to them. Lord, fill us with your spirit. Enable us to do the works that you did, Lord, for we are helpless apart from you. Father, we love you and we praise you and we thank you for all that you're doing in us and through us, Lord. Amen.